Two Good Talks is the show where fashion industry experts share real-world knowledge gained through hands-on experience. Hosted by Ram Sareen, the founder of Tuka Tech. Going back to what you said a little earlier about data and how do we use this data. Today, it's got to be all about data, and there's plenty of data points. If you don't have data, you can buy data on your consumer. But data used with, how, how do you use it well? The data has to be used with algorithms, with the right artificial intelligence, with technology that guys like you are coming up with all the time, the hardware as well as the software. So data with algorithms driven by artificial intelligence can give you analytics that will help you to make the right decision. And everybody should have data by now because everyone has, if you don't have any other data, every retailer knows exactly a customer's credit card, when they make purchases, how they make purchases, when do they purchase at the beginning of the month, in the middle of the month, at the end of the month, what are the buying patterns? I can tell how I play this game with Amazon. I get on around breakfast time in the morning and I'll shop for plumbing supplies, electrical supplies for the house. In the afternoon, I look for t-shirts or jeans or anything, yeah? And in the evening, I get on Amazon Prime. So I start pulling down the latest videos, movies, series, etc. Do this for three days. On the fourth day, I go in the morning, even before I've looked for anything, Plumbing and electrical supplies are running on the side. So they know this login from this computer at this time, this IP address. The habit is this. He may look for something else, yes, but usually this is what it looks for. So they've already got the data and created, the algorithm has created a pattern and the artificial intelligence, the, what they call AWS, Amazon Web Services, is nothing more than AI. Right. The AI program is saying, this is what this guy looks for between nine and 11, give it to him. You know, this is what he looks for at lunchtime, let's give it to him. You know, maybe just to confuse them, next week I'll start looking for uh, maybe hats and uh, underwear, uh, some some new item, I don't know. Let's see what they come up with. I want to see how good their algorithm is. You are testing, you are testing. But hey, you know what your objective you know what they is say? doing this? Artificial, artificial intelligence is cannot compete. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the worst part is, a lot of people don't understand this. Alexa is always listening. Yeah. Yes. It's always listening. Yes. Making mistakes sometimes, but it's always listening. A husband and wife are fighting. Mm -hmm. And within hours, their phone started getting ads of matrimonial lawyers. This is how dangerous that shit is. <laughs> we we uh, have no life left. You're watching something. I wanted to see what is it that is being delivered to my house that I saw a bill that my wife had bought. So I look at that site and for next three days, everywhere I went into web, that ad starts coming in from other things that site was selling. This is getting crazy out there while they are steering you in the direction they want you to, even if you opened up by mistake that thing, okay? I don't know if we are reaching a new height of losing all our own personal creativity and personal privacy, but let's stay with garment industry. The poor guys 
where we get all our products made and a lot of people, their livelihood depends on that because their education level may not be as high as the people who are buying all the clothes or their economic conditions may not be as good. We are setting rules for them sitting in America because now we have a stomach which is full. And I remember 50 years ago in this country, now I've seen the terrible working conditions that we've gone through, but we are not extending the same courtesy to our suppliers or helping them get up there so they can rise. We're pushing them to do things which are not legal in our ways. Why? Just for the 10 cents? Just for the 20 cents? I mean, it's like a piss in the wind, man. It's in, in, in the bigger picture, that entire amount of labor that goes in, because remember, these countries who are using this low labor cost, their cost of material remains exactly the same because it's a commodity. Their labor content is less than 20% of the total FOB value. And we are trying to squeeze them out of that. That is the biggest possible shame on it's, every it's, brand and retailer who is out there and trying to squeeze these people for their pennies and losing actually, their own dollars. They are paying bonuses before filing chapter 11. I don't want to mention names of these brands and retailers, but it is atrocious. It is unworthy of them being, being in business or being supported. We as a consumer should boycott these people. We as a consumer should teach these people lesson. If nothing else, let this be the example for the other retailers who are trying to follow the same nonsense. But I tell you something, if I can fix one retailer out of this conversation, one retailer, I would think my life was worth it. And this has gone so bad. It's all about materialistics. It's not about humane mm -hmm. conditions. That's where life well, get changed. You are very passionate about it. It's your message is obvious. And uh, what you've touched on is two subjects. One is it's very emotional. And two, it's very highly sensitive. Sensitive because of the disparity that there is. You know, in fact, you said 20% is the labor cost. If you break it down, when you look at the fabric, the cut and sew, the packing and finishing, the embroidery, printing, laundry, whatever there is, and the logistics, of the total FOB or CIF cost, labor is rarely more than five or six percent. And you make a very good point. I used to argue this also a lot of time. Maybe it's because we come from similar backgrounds. I say when you're trying to beat up a vendor to get your margin, all that you're squeezing is that five or six percent. If you reduce 15% of the CMT, you're reducing 15% of 5%. Right. That is 0.75% of the total FOB. So what have you saved? Nothing. If it's a $100 garment, you saved 75 cents. You know? But but if, on the other hand, you go in rather than sending the vultures to get these people to reduce money, send a technical person to help them save fabric, better conditions, save working losses. I'll tell you something, honestly, I'm really mad at a lot of brands and retailers who have put their quality control people in all these countries who have no idea of what good practices are 
but they are the one who are driving it. Today, packages or tech packs are sent to the vendor and that's it. In the old day, we used to send a tech team down there. What you're talking about is helping the vendor. We used to send them the technical expertise with the pack. Say, guys, this is what it is. Now here we've broken it down by operation. Here is a visual aid for each operation. So each machine uh, operator can see what it is they're doing. Otherwise, the guy that's sewing the armhole is sewing the armhole, the one that's sewing the neck, sewing the neck, the one that's doing the side seam. But how do they know if they're doing it right or wrong? So the visual aid was supposed to help them. And then they were taught, materials handling how do you handle the tension the lower layer the upper layer and how do you gradually give it not just pull the start and the finish put the layers together and in order to get it done fast step on the pedal and boom run it through you know so teaching people how to produce stuff right and then you talked about quality controllers one thing i've tried to act on for a long time and unsuccessfully is you don't need quality control. By quality control, I mean those people that they call QC inspectors. Inspectors. You, need you don't need control, but you don't need quality inspectors. Yes, you cannot inspect quality into a garment. Right. Agreed. Once it is. Once it is made, it is made. If the collar is wrong, it's wrong. If the armhole is wrong, it's wrong. Even if you correct it, you open it up and you sew it again. Number one, it's a lot of time. It's very right. expensive. It's not worth it. And number two, an experienced eye can always tell that there is an alteration there. So what you all that you've done is You've taken a reject and moved it up into a second. You've not brought it to first. The correct way and the efficient way that saves you cost and time and money and everything is to do it right the first time. Correct. The way you do it right the first time is you have pre-production meetings between the supervisors and the floor managers you look at the style, you discuss the style, you go through each and every operation so that each person knows what is expected of them. So it's about managing expectations. You manage expectations, you set the targets, you measure. If you can't measure the result, you can't manage the result, right? So, and as they say, we, we tend to measure what we treasure, right? And the other old saying we used to have, I got it out here, you don't get what you expect, you get what you inspect, right? So we, these were old sayings we had, and I used to try these, and some factories, yes, they understood it and they would do it, but you know, they have a high rate of attrition, that set of people goes away, a new factory opened up, the supervisor went somewhere and became a manager. The sewing operator went somewhere, became a supervisor, and you have a new set of people. And again, all that investment you made in training is then lost. You don't have that culture to keep it going. If two people are gone, how do you replace those two and bring them into that culture again? So it's always not about inspecting the garment and Oh, we do AQL. What is AQL? Out of 300 garments, you inspect 27 or 37 or whatever. That's fantastic. But all it can tell you is how many garments are there which are expected to be A quality, how many are expected to be there which are B quality or C quality. But it does not give you the quality you want. To produce quality, you've got to engineer that quality into the production process. And it's not you a cannot... difficult job. It's not a difficult job. Because you, a lot of people don't understand, um, think, think lo logically, think logically. In the cutting room, we do two things. We spread fabric, we cut number of inches. 
perimeter inches. Doesn't matter what shape it is, whether it is a pant or a shirt or a blouse or whatever, we are cutting perimeter inches. We're not cutting pants and shirts. Mm -hmm. We're spreading fabric. There's different kinds of fabrics. Therefore, we need to have the expertise. And I keep telling people, which is such a contrast in thinking, everybody thinks, what is it to lay a piece of fabric? So they bring people off the street and put them on laying fabric, spreading. Yeah. That is the most skilled job in the cutting room. How you spread. The spreader is not just the spreader, it's also inspector to see the fabric flaws, to see the right weights, to make sure the marker is of the same weights. The QC that done at the SOP level should be at the spreading. Once that thing is spread, butter has no option but to cut it. If that spread is six inches longer than the marker and it's 100 layers, we just threw away 600 inches. Cutter can't do anything. It should have been done at the spreading level. If the marker is four inches narrower than the actual width which has been spread, we just threw away 6% fabric. It's nothing to do. So everything was spreader. But we have the least skilled people sitting doing that. In sewing room, 75 to 90 percent of the machines are same regardless of whether you're making blouses or shirts pants or jackets a single needle seamer sergers buttonholes tackers and so on and people who are operating those machines they don't know what they are sewing a side seam of a pant and a shirt and a side whatever is a side seam because the length makes a difference so my skill level in my thinking and training should be, hey, this person can operate this machine, can do this length or these operations. This person can do single needle, can do small parts, just like my machine's capabilities. It's only when it reaches 70, 75% of the product is finished, it starts taking the shape what product it is. The thinking process in the quality control has to be at the same way that we tune the machines right for the same number of stitches per inch and the timing of the machine. The operator has to be timed with that same quality control so that they can monitor their own quality. I, 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 gotta, share, I gotta share one little incident. I walked in when I was doing consulting and this company was having three, three and a half percent seconds. And every time I used to ask, um, every time I went into consulting, my first question used to be from the CEO. Yeah. So tell me, what do you think is your biggest problem? And 90% of them will say, and this is back in the early 80s, oh, we have a major issue of quality. Right away, I knew the guy has no idea what his problem is. He has just identified the end result that he's got 3% seconds. Why are they seconds? Is the machines leaking oil? Is the floor too dirty? If I know I can go fix that area to fix the quality rather than finding out in the end that I have a 3.5%. So some, one day I decided to have a little fun with this guy who was really thinking he knows it all. So I said, hey, you know what? What if I say that you double your quality control people. You got four and you put now eight. The wages of the extra four, do you think it will reduce the number of seconds or increase? He said, of course it will reduce. I said, do it for a month, let's do it. So we added double the staff in quality control and our seconds went up 50%. <laughs> My point is only one, if somebody knows that I can slack off because somebody else is going to pick it up, unless I am responsible for my own quality, there is no other quality control or quality respectively. But somebody yes, has to it, teach them how to do you it. Don't, you don't control quality, you engineer the quality, you build it's the quality. It's a culture. 
and coming back to uh, you know the the workers and their skills and the way they handle the fabric etc that is unfortunately one of the fragilities of the apparel industry the apparel industry probably has the lowest barriers to entry all you need is to set up a cutting table and a few sewing machines and a few inspection tables and you are a manufacturer you're running a business you will remember the old days when the indian government started promoting exports to get uh, foreign exchange everybody became an exporter putting 20 machines in their garage at the back and the dining tables or the cutting tables right at least in new delhi that's how it was i grew up and, like that man yeah my point in is 1960 yeah 1960 my father was one of the largest exporters in india he had a big dining table machine operators and i tell you i'm not proud of this thing i remember them these sewing machine operators came from the villages and they mm -hmm. used to have these treadle machines and yeah. they would work all day, all night because yeah. they were paid by the piece and they right. would sleep right there. They had no yeah. other place to go and sleep. Those right. were not the good days. And yes, you're mm -hmm. right. But if you look at one more fact, every country on this planet started out in the garment industry whether that, it's that is, or that, any one of them. I'm, I'm not talking about the quality of life of the operators, but I'm talking about one, the low barriers to entry, which like you said, allows anybody to start this industry. And also because of the low barriers to entry, it is an industry with very high mobility, which allows the investor to pick up his machines and walk away because the rest of the sunk cost is very low. And add to that the fact that you can pick up people, like you said, from the villages or from the streets who may be totally illiterate. They don't know how to read and write their name, but with four to five weeks of training on the sewing machine, they are productive apparel, manufacture um, operators in an apparel factory right so what now you've got low barriers to entry low investment high mobility you can pick up and go away and the quality of labor you're taking is totally illiterate in eight weeks you have an operator who can make a garment but who still can't write his or her name many of them would still uh, put their fingerprint in order to get their salary they don't know how to sign so Starting with spinning, which is capital intensive, or you almost don't touch anything by hand, except for the lay down of the bales, goes through the blow rooms, the carding, the tow ropes, the spinning, out the other end comes the yarn. Then you go to the textile facility. Again, it's capital intensive and you need educated people. You need textile engineers, you need electrical and mechanical engineers, you need uh, color chemists, you need skills. The only unskilled guy, labor is the guy who cleans out the, uh, what do you call that, the, uh, uh, the vat after you've done the dyeing or the jet after you've finished uh, dyeing your synthetics, right? Everything else. And the, the, of course, the guy that pushes the trolley around take the dyed fabric to the center so that you can dry it and fold it, etc. So it's only the movement of the fabric that is the unskilled labor. Everything else is skilled labor. So you're starting with capital intensive to a hybrid of capital and skills. And as you go further down the line, right, yarn was, let's say, $2.25 a pound. Fabric is now let's say denim five or six dollars a yard. One pair of jeans, which takes 1.2 yards of fabric. By the time you finish cutting, sewing, putting the labels and the tags and the uh, uh, hand sanding and the whiskers and uh, the washing and all that kind of thing. Nowadays you do it with lasers. You come out with a 10, $12 pair of jeans. So 
there is an inverse relationship between the investment and the added value at each stage. The highest investment, which is the spinning, has the lowest amount of labor. Then the hybrid of investment and labor, but very skilled labor, the sure. textile. And between those two, you've got 70% of the value of the garment. And then that cut and sew, which can destroy the fabric and make it a rag, is in the hands of people who, like you said, don't know how to spread that fabric. It could be a very expensive fabric, but the guys are just walking back and forth, laying it. Not They aren't aware of the tension. And if it's not laid, laid right, after you wash the garment, it's going to have torquing and the seams are going to go this way and that way, or the collar and the neck is not going to be right, etc. So there is this disparity between the, the highest investment, the lowest investment, and the quality of labor at each of those stages. When you've got the the lowest investment, you've also got the lowest quality of labor, but unfortunately, that is where you've got the highest value add in the transformation or in the value chain, right? So we've created an extreme vulnerability at that point. I agree with a lot of things and staying focused on um, the issue on hand, uh, for, let's just look at it. This is an opportunity to reset. Mm -hmm. And if we are going to reset, let's look at what really worked and worked well. We know that over the time, things got deteriorated to the extent that we got into a lot of trouble without even the COVID. This, this thing was inevitable. I've been saying that since 2018, that by 2023, we will be producing 40% less garments. So the, the lessons here are what did work? And you touched base on several things. One was the way we used to send our technical people, our technical team, our experts, our engineers, to show them the better way of doing it. The example was Sri Lanka, as a matter of fact. Back 30 years ago, 35 years ago, when these companies like Hydromanis and Mass and Randix created joint ventures with American companies and British companies. The British companies and the American companies sent their people over there to teach them the American ways of working. This is one of the reasons why Sri Lankans are ahead of a lot of other countries, neighboring countries. But the sad part is everybody stopped. And whatever these people learned, they were there in time war. That, that was happening 30, 35 years ago in America. Even in America, we've done some phenomenal things, but those things never really trickled down to the Asian. So if we want our supply chain to be efficient, to be productive and cost effective, then we've got to find ways to first fix what is missing over there whether it is technical know-how, it doesn't have to be money. It doesn't have to be technology. Sometimes it is only just technical know-how, how to do it right first time. In the old days, we were also sending them a sew by sample, not a tech pack, but in order to get vendor to do more things so that we can do less things in our place, we actually lost a lot more. I, 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 I was in a, in a meeting at a brand and the guy said to me, you know, the samples don't cost me anything. 90% of the samples come in. Look at that pile over there, okay? We don't even like it. 
But my ask, answer was, you're paying for it. If your supplier is incurring the cost, they have to include that cost of doing business in their total. Yeah, there's no free lunch. There's no free lunch. That is right. There is no free lunch. This is the message. If you can summarize, <clears throat> in your opinion, what was it that really worked? And what is it the advice that you give to the brands and retailers that item A, B, C, D, E, five items that they should be doing, they should be concentrating to help. So everybody is a happy, happy person. Today, here's what I see. Go a little before COVID and you had the possibility of a tariff war between the US and China. So that was the epicenter. And from there, it all the ripples started going out. So everyone started scrambling from late 2018 to look at what next after China or what can we substitute? What can we move out of China? Nobody wanted to move 100% away from China, maybe 5, 10, 15, 20, 30%. And even off that 30%, the initial movement would be such that your supply chains are not disrupted too much. Because moving out of China means establishing a whole new supply chain for retailers. And it takes time to establish a supply chain that can move that amount of volume. To move 30% out of China is you're moving billions of dollars worth of goods. And billions of dollars worth of goods means now you start translating that into how many different fabrics, how many different colors, how many different styles, how many different skews. It's a massive operation. And do you have enough infrastructure in the countries that you want to move to in order to look after your production, your pre-production, your quality, your logistics, et cetera, et cetera. So it started before COVID and then came COVID. And COVID was something that nobody was prepared for. So the first reaction was what people are now calling a collective dissonance. Suppliers had to shut down. Now you've got goods in your store, you've got inventory in the stores, inventory in the warehouse, inventory in the pipeline, and you've got orders that have been played with, played with manufacturers. So with this collective dissonance, a supply shock and a demand shock, usually you have one or the other. If there's a recession or if there is an earthquake in some place or a volcano in some place or a tsunami, et cetera, those are, you know, your supply is disrupted, your retail is still alive. 2008, we had the financial crash. We knew there was a recession and it was the demand that died, but supply was still alive. This was the first time in history where supply and demand both died simultaneously at no notice. It was like shut and that's it. Throw the switch, everything shut down. And like you said, those who are working for Wall Street or worried about Wall Street, the first knee-jerk reaction was self-preservation. Forget everything else. All the compliance policies and governance and ESG and EHS and environmental health and safety or ESG or uh, you know, environment, social and uh, governance rules, et cetera, that was made for protecting the worker, the worker's welfare, the livelihood of the workers. So the livelihoods went out the door and their lives were at stake because most of the retailers, their first reaction was, look at the small print. We can cancel our orders, but let's cancel them. Then let's wait for the board of directors, the legal department, the CFOs, etc., to get together, have their meetings and wait for the rest. So first reaction, Cancel. And the ripple effect of that was massive. It's only later that many of them came back and said, okay, you can ship, but we'll take the goods 90 days from now. Some said, we'll take the goods now, but we'll pay you in 90 days. Others said, uh, you can ship in installments. 
15% each month and we'll start paying you in January. They came up with various permutations and combinations of how to resolve that problem. But that first reaction was something that damaged trust. So what will I tell manufacturers and uh, retailers? The first thing that will be repaired in the post-COVID environment and whatever the new normal or new normals are going to be is the repair of the trust. The relationships have to be rebuilt. That is number one. After the trust is rebuilt, then both sides have to sit down and this time at that table, you've got to have more than just the, the retailer and the sourcing and the manufacturer, but you've also got to have the mills and say, listen guys, from start to finish, what happened? And how do we prepare to avoid future shocks? So how do we build resilience? And how do we build agility? So number one, repair the trust. Number two, figure out how to build resilience and agility into your supply strategy or into your supply chain, your sourcing strategies. And number three, at the retail end, you now have to look at who is the new consumer? What is the mindset? What is the consumer confidence? You have people who have lost their jobs and who may never get jobs back again. You have people who will go back to work in a few months, but don't know whether they'll have full-time jobs. You have those who have jobs, but don't know how long the jobs will last. So with this anxiety, with this fear, with this uncertainty, with this volatility, people's spending habits are going to change. They may buy a pair of jeans and a t-shirt or a polo shirt, but they will expect it to last longer. So you may have to design goods that are more durable and will last longer if you want to satisfy your customer. And who is the customer? Today, you have four generations of customers. You and I are boomers. The baby boomers are still around. And, and most the of them with the money. And yes, and they have the money. They to spend. are the one who will support and save this economy. The baby boomers. Then, well, then you have the Gen X. You have the no, first you got, yeah, the Gen X, okay. the millennials, and the Gen Z. And if you look at Gen Z, what their brand preference are, what their customer loyalties are, it is extremely different from millennials and the boomers. Their priorities, when you look at, uh, you know, because they've grown up with the digital generation, so it's Apple and Amazon are the brands that are their most favorite brands. We grew up without Apple and Amazon, they didn't exist till we were in our 40s and 50s, right? So our brand loyalties were extremely different. Also, the return, what are the things that are not happening today that the boomers and the Gen Xs would like to return to, whether it's going to the movies, going for drives, you look at the Gen Zs, they don't miss that. There was a survey done of about 25,000 uh, people, and there's, I, was, I read this just three days ago. There's remarkable differences. So besides fixing the relationship, creating resilience, agility, building options at the front end of your supply chain, on this side, you've got to figure out your customer, your customer's habits, what are the new patterns going to be? And how each one, I mean, JCPenney is going to look at it very differently than Gap is going to look at it very differently than Bloomingdale's or Neiman Marcus. So it's not going to be one new normal. There's going to be a lot of different new normals. And there's going to be a lot of potential. Going back to the models of Stitch Fix, Bonobos, Mod Cloth, even rent a runway and companies like that. Those are innovations that 
maybe now we need to look at mergers and acquisitions. So some of the big guys have to look at partnering with those or buying those companies out, incorporating their business models into their DNA. And uh, let's see what the new success will look like. So I see very interesting times ahead. Wonderful advice, wonderful advice. Um, the only caution um, I would like to leave um, this Tuka Talks is um, do not consider startups as a light threat. It's not. More than ever, they are the most threatening businesses for established companies. Yes, 80% of these startups will fail. 80%. But the 20% are in numbers, which is so huge in hundreds of thousands of these startup companies. Even the 20% who really make it are going to wipe many of those big guys out. So do not consider these startups with ideas of making a genes for you on order I have personally seen, I am a witness. I have a large customer base and the empathy for these people who are making it happen. They are a real life threat to corporations who are getting comfortable or thinking that they've got it. They don't. You need to think every day how to reinvent yourself or somebody else is going to go over your head. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, my friend Mark, with all your wisdom. I think this much time is not enough. You and I need to get together one more time, not for you and me, but for the people. It is impossible to, to pick your brain and get your ideas. Probably you've forgotten more than people will remember in their lifetime. So we need to poke those memories. Thank you for sharing your experiences with Levi's and with Ralph Lauren, with uh, Gap. And you've had some amazing, amazing, amazing experience. Companies who are legends in this business. Thank you. Thank you, Raj. It's uh, Ram. I mean, it's uh, a pleasure to talk to you. You yourself are a prodigy and a genius in your field. We shouldn't discount what you are doing in any way. It is transformational and uh, the best is yet to come what you're doing. I know it, you know. So I'm available whenever you want to talk ramblings of you and me together if people can benefit from it you know there's uh, there's a lot more we can talk about in terms of uh, patterns of uh, retail chains and uh, oh yeah the, singularity the, the, you know there so. are three necessities in life okay food shelter and clothing uh sorry we can't do anything about shelter and food but if we are talking about food, think about your buying patterns. When you walk into the grocery store, which is selling a lot of other stuff, and if you were really hungry, look at the basket that you have filled in versus go in after dinner shopping and look at the basket that you pick up. 80% of shopping in a food store is what they call instant buying or buying by suggestion how the goods were placed same thing runs in business when our stomach is full we have different principles for others but when we are hungry covid 19 our all other stuff goes away in the garbage and we become like you said, 
self-preservation. We look at who gives a shit, what they are, whether they are compliant or not. What happened? You're the one who wanted workers to be taken care of. And they are the first ones who are getting hurt. Stop. Yeah. Let's they, have they, rules for everybody, okay? We all bleed red. We all bleed red. We, we will talk more about it. Thank you. How, like we say in India, Namaskar. Thank you, boss. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Watch full episodes and clips at tukatech.com slash tukatalks or listen on your favorite podcast platform. Subscribe to the Tuka Talks YouTube channel and follow Tuka Talks on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter.